Okay, I'm, we're on Facebook Live. Uh, we'll see if people join us. Um, I'm just going to expand my screen. Ah, there's Hamed. Um, so, as usual, being human beings, um, how's the weather in Portland, uh, Ian? Uh, <laughs> it is snowing today. It's snowing. Okay. Big uh, flakes. Big flakes. Okay. Portland, Oregon, out in the, the U.S. West Coast, near the mountains. Um, here I'm in Toronto, Canada, and uh, it's a balmy, very, very mild late uh, February Sunday. But uh, we're expecting crazy weather today. They're talking about a massive cold front moving in and um, winds up to, you know, 100 kilometers an hour, which is about 60 miles an hour. Uh, so I had a client this afternoon who was supposed to drive in from far away, and I told her not to come. Um, it can just be too risky. Well, how, how are things in Mexico, Karen? Well, it's full on spring here uh, and uh, everything's bursting out. I have lots of new flowers. Roses are even blooming. It's wow. just beautiful. Spring in the late, Feb late February. That sounds idyllic in some ways. It is. Um, it is. February. Up. We get about 75 in the day and 50 at night. It's perfect weather. Okay. Antoine, how are things in Beirut? Uh, fine, uh, we have a spring weather today. Spring. Are the yeah. flowers starting to bloom? And, uh, um, yes, yes. I mean, I guess you don't really get winter. Um, you may get a little bit of snow, do you, and a little bit of cold, but... Yes, we have snow and we have... Uh, Lebanon is a very small country. It's, uh, the beach is very close to the mountains. Have snow and we have uh, beaches and lots of cedar trees. I hope <laughs> the cedars of Lebanon. That's what you know in the Bible. It's known for the cedar trees. Uh, Ahmed, it looks like you're driving in a car. Um, yeah, I'm in the car, but I'm not driving. I have. Uh, yeah, no, I notice you're on the passenger side. So uh, yes, um, yes, yes. Uh, are, you, are you driving by the pyramids? Uh, no. No, no, not the pyramids. Yeah, it's, it's eastern uh, Cairo, so it's uh, no, it's far, far away from the pyramids. Far away from the pyramids. I, huh? Yes, I, I wish I was driving by the pyramids so I, uh, yeah. I can show you the, <laughs> the pictures. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah, the weather now is uh, getting better. Uh, we're almost uh, the, the cold weather is almost finished. Uh, we're end of, end of February. Uh, we're about to enter the the nice uh, shiny hot uh, weather. So it's the uh, it's better right now. Yeah, I mean weather patterns are changing here. Um, February should be our really wintry month, but right now everything outside is melting. There's still lots of ice out there and whatever, but it's all melting. It's such a mild day, and they're predicting it going up to plus nine. Uh, this is Celsius. Um, so that's something like 50 degrees, I would think 45, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which at the end of February is very unusual for Canada. Um, and then we're supposed to get a cold front moving in and gusts and, uh, uh, how is the inner work going? Any comments on the inner work before we go to an inner exercise? Um, so last week I was talking about, um, feeling kind of stuck or, or stuck's not quite the right word, but it's, you know, kind of unable to do anything um, and kind of depressed about that. You had pointed out that depression implies there's some kind of, you know, ego, me, me, me thing going on. Yes. And so the next time that came up for me, I, lo I kind of, I, I tried to kind of find that that part of it, um, and I and I, ca I caught this sense of like, you know, I've been doing meditation or inner work of some sort or another for a while. <laughs> in yeah, my life. yeah. Um, and there was there was this flavor of like, oh, I should be better. Like I like this should be going better for me. Why isn't this working better for me? Like. You know, there was there was that me me me, um, and sort of dropping that for a moment, or at least 
pushing it out of my identity or the thing that I took seriously, um, I found a much greater appreciation for the struggle that I'm in and I felt much kind of closer to, I don't know how to describe it exactly. Um, I think before I was feeling kind of lost, like I, I didn't have anything to really get my attention to rest on. Um, and when I was able to kind of push that away, um, I had a much stronger sense of, oh, I'm, I'm working with this particular, how do I put it? I don't know. It just, it, it, it things kind of slowed down and got more real and solid. <laughs> and I, maybe I just had more energy to, to focus on it. Cause I'm not really sure what that feels like, you know, how to, how to be able to know that I have more energy and be able to use it for, for work. So, I mean, I'm kind of throwing out, you know, darts here, but something like that, like something felt more, more real in, in my system. Um, okay. I mean, you know what, I will address this for the, you know, after we do the inner exercise, I mean, what, what we're talking about is extremely important. Uh, the person who did the most work, on the different classes of energies and the different orders of energies uh, was uh, Mr. Gurdjieff's student, J.G. Bennett. And Bennett wrote a book called Energies. It's a tiny book. Um, I underlined so much of it when I read it years ago. I would love to copy it and share it with people, but it's just my, my copy's too uh, marked up. But he talked about hydrogen 24 being, he called it sensitive energy. And I don't like that term because sensitive and sensation are too alike. I actually call it the energy of identity. And C12 is the energy of identity. Um, along the, the, the realm of, uh, uh, of the different molecules of hydrogen 24, they're all involved in personal consciousness. And when C12 gets misused, uh, one of the ways we can taste its misuse is underneath it is the ego. But I'll go into that a lot more afterwards. But that's a very good and a very, I mean, I'm glad you observed that. I'm glad you observed that, that quality because whenever we misuse C12, sexual energy, the highest energy the human body naturally produces. Under Mr. Gurdjieff said, at least in, when it was translated into English by Uspensky, Uspensky uh, used the word vehemence, that there's a vehemence behind the misuse of C12. I've noticed within myself that beneath the vehemence is the ego and the subjectivizing principle. It's like me, me, me. So even positive emotions can be bad, not just negative emotion. You've got to taste the ego beneath them. There's that positive emotion. Hey, I'm on top of the world. And if the ego is underneath it, you know, it's still the misuse of C12. And intellectually, well, I'll get into this later. It'll be the topic of what I, where I will begin. Um, any other comments on inner work, questions on inner work? That, uh, um, Antoine. Uh, as Ian mentioned, uh, sometimes, uh, but I uh, feel that everybody uh, has have negative energy nowadays. People, have, do you think it's uh, planetary influences? What we call uh, the we talk a bit about planetary influences on our own. Um, it, I think something different is going on. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff was in America in the 1920s. And it was when he was in America, he noticed something extremely disturbing. And he said it hit America first, but it was going to engulf the world. And back then, he was specifically referring to the rise of mass media. He noticed that a newspaper columnist would write an opinion uh, column, and then a week later, a million people 
would have absorbed that comment and would be spouting it without doing any deeper work, without doing any confrontative logic. And that's the word he used, confrontative logic. He said that's a process that occurs both at the conscious and the subconscious level. And it's a, an area where we are failing our children by teaching them by rote, by making them memorize things, by not teaching them the process of confrontative logic. So someone says something and we absorb it and then we begin to spout it as the truth. And this, this has got even worse now. Um, oops, I'm gonna, this, this has got even worse now uh, in today's age with the rise of the internet. Um, I know someone who believes the earth is flat. They went out to disprove it. Um, they don't understand that, you know, 10% uh, of all universities, um, the geological department, the physics department, the geology department, so many scientists, um, aeronautical engineers, flights, air traffic, uh, satellites, all of that would be the biggest lie and the biggest conspiracy in the world. And all of our technology would fall apart if the earth was flat. But they go down a rabbit hole and they absorb an impression and then that leads them to another. And unfortunately with Google, with the algorithms, the more you go into conspiracies, the more those websites and YouTube channels and videos are presented to you. And the most unreliable part of ourselves is our head brain. Um, our head brain is like one twentieth of our being. There is so much more to us than our head brain. But the problem is in this world with the connectivity, with the online, we have gone more and more down the rabbit hole with the head brain. And people absorb all of these unreal ideas and they're willing to kill and die and maim and steal and cheat and do all sorts of nasty things. Um, you know, we just have to watch Donald Trump in America and how he repeats a message over and over and over and over again until people believe it is the truth without exploring it, without looking any deeper. And this is something that politicians are mastering. And this is a global phenomenon. Um, we saw it with uh, uh, Britain and Brexit and leaving the EU and the lies. And we're seeing it um, globally around the world. People are just focusing on the head brain and they're manipulating it. And it's the most unreliable part of ourselves. So. This was a, a, a massive wave that Mr. Gurdjieff saw in America in the 1920s as a result of newspaper opinion columns. You know, this, that, that was before television, when, you know, before talking movies, before the internet, before satellites, before this world we're in now. And so this degeneration has continued. And people are living more and more and more and more in this part. And you've got to bring it back to what is real. My breath is real. My body is real. Um, so that's, you know, from a Gurdjieffian perspective, um, this was something that Mr. Gurdjieff noticed close to 100 years ago. And he saw it when he visited America. Um, so, yeah. Any other comments about the inner work or whatever? Um, and I muted uh, Ahmed's microphone. Um, I, he, I don't know if he, it shows that he's still there, but he's in a car in Cairo in Egypt. So um, let's do an inner exercise. Uh, I was on a group. I'm on a group. It's a strange story. I want to learn Portuguese. I want to go to the Amazonian rainforest. Um, so I've been posting in English and Portuguese. Um, I found a copy of In Search of the Miraculous in Portuguese, and I started posting these on a Brazilian Gurdjieff group, and they made me a moderator, um, which is I, I can read it, but I can't speak it, and I can't write it. But there was a post, and I posted it on my wall 
um, recently where Mr. Gurdjieff was talking about how what will take a month as a fakir through physical deprivation will take a week with a monk working on the emotional center, which would take a day. And I, I could be mixing this up or not mixing it up, but the time span, not quite right. A day as a yogi working through the mind. And he's talking about the way of the body, the way of the heart and the way of the mind. Don't get too caught up in the labels. And then he said the fourth way, it's like taking a pill. Uh, and then someone said, where do I get this pill? And the pill is actually the ability to digest higher hydrogens. And the primary way we do this is through inner work and inner exercises. One of the most important exercises is the collected state exercise where we imagine ourselves surrounded by an atmosphere at the end of inner work and then we breathe the atmosphere in and as we breathe out, we imagine something remains. Another very important exercise, I've got it online. Uh, for those who may be watching online on the Facebook, uh, when I posted yesterday, you know, the, the announcement for the upcoming group today, I posted uh, 10 uh, inner exercises I've done, and there's a, a six and a half minute one called Digesting Air, and that's based purely on the description and the words of Mr. Gurdjieff as uh, found in uh, 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 G.I. Gurdjieff uh, talks, early talks, 1914 to 1931, even though the talk is right at the end of the book and it's labeled 1939. Um, so that was his direct explanation. <laughs> but uh, his student, George Adi, uh, in Australia, uh, gave an even better inner exercise. I don't do the full inner exercise that George I.D. did. Um, I have a recording of it. A friend of mine in Australia gave me the inner recording. And so uh, I've taken it to the point where it's just beyond a lot of people, but it gives us an idea of how to begin to consciously assimilate the higher molecules in the air. If you've read about the food diagrams in, in Search of the Miraculous, Mr. Gurdjieff says that, uh, you know, say that there are 20 molecules in the air and some, a normal person breathes them in and they breathe out 10, meaning they absorbed 10. But it's possible to breathe them in and breathe out five, meaning we absorb 15. And it's these higher molecules that we need to accumulate in our body to do inner work. Um, the higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. And this is the alchemical process. And if you read chapter nine of In Search of the Miraculous, where he talks about the food diagrams, he talks about how in each transformation, there is already a higher substance present in the body, which meets with the lower to blend in the middle. J.G. Bennett did a little bit more work with this. Um, the, 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 what I'm gonna describe right now is partially uh, the actual places in the body where the transformation occurs is found in Beelzebub tales. The first place food is transformed in the body is the mouth, then it moves into the stomach, then it moves into the duodenum, and this is Mr. Gurdjieff, then into the liver, then into the cerebral hemispheres, then the cerebellum, and then down into the testes, ovaries. So dough in the mouth, ray in the stomach, me in the duodenum, and then it has to meet with air in order to move to the fa of the liver, and then do re mi fa, and then uh, so in the cerebellum, so 48, La 24 in the cerebellum, or Do 48, uh, Sol 48 in the cerebral hemispheres, La 24 in the cerebellum, and C12 in the testes. Um, so J.G. Bennett says that when the food comes into the mouth, 
the higher substance in the mouth is our saliva. So as we chew the food, it mixes with the saliva. So the higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. And then as that goes down into our stomach, the higher element in our stomach is the gastric juices, which then meet with that, uh, the food at that, tra that, that transform from the mouth. And then the higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. And then it moves into our duodenum where it meets with something higher and blending into the middle. And we've got to remember that throughout each of these processes, it's not a complete transformation. Because every time something is transformed up, something is transformed down. So you have a pile of golden sand and you get a, 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 a pan and you start panning for gold and you will end up with a pile of gold and sand. So for what's refined in our mouth, some of it's refined up and some of it's refined down and the part that's refined down eventually ends up uh, being excreted or, 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 or urinated out or whatever. So it's not just a movement up. Mr. Gurdjieff focused on the movement up. It's a movement up. It's a refining and a coarsening that happens at each level. But the higher has to be present. So we have to have saliva in our mouth in order to, to begin the digestion of the food. We have to have the gastric juices in our stomach in order for what then goes into our stomach to be digested. And then that turns into chyme, which goes into our duodenum. And there has to be a higher element present in order for that transformation to occur. So in order to properly work on ourselves, we have to have higher elements within ourselves. And one way of doing this is through the inner work. This is why we can self-remember for a certain period of time and then we, exp we use up all of the energy and we're not able to do it again for the rest of the day. And, uh, and the next day we wake up and we've got the energy and we can do it again and then we waste it. Mr. Gurdjieff said that we actually can potentially wake up in the morning with all the energy we need to do all of the inner work throughout the day, but we waste it through identification, negative emotions, all sorts of other different things. So this is an explanation of this exercise. This exercise allows us to transform, or not to transform, but to breathe in and to bring into our body some of these higher elements which we need uh, for us. On uh, uh, my, the, the Toronto uh, or, or the Gurdjieff Group of Toronto YouTube channel that I have, that I've also put on my uh, uh, wall, um, I call it the morning sitting. It's a 22-minute recorded exercise that I think we should do every day in order to accumulate these higher molecules. So let's just begin by acknowledging that, you know, not only do we have a self in World 48, that's the earthly realm, we have a self, a growing self, not fully developed, in world 24, the planetary realm, the realm of essence, and essence we share with humanity. And we also have an embryonic self in world 12, the realm of the real eye. So it's good to affirm when we begin work that we're working along three lines. I am doing this work for myself. The embryonic self, the real I. I am doing this work for my fellow human being. Mr. Gurdjieff said that we do not have an essence that is ours. It is a quality we share with humanity, and we should not be identified with our essence. I've talked about how, like a glass of water and a drop of the water, our essence is a drop of the water that will go back into that ocean of human essence. So I work for my fellow human being, and then I work for this sacred planet. I work for the earth herself. 
My body is composed of metals, minerals, elements that come from the earth. So whenever I work, I'm actually working along these three lines when I do inner work for myself, for my fellow human being, and for the earth herself. And it's always nice to affirm this and to recognize this. And then the power of attention actually comes from our prefrontal cortex. It's a, a, a power of the advanced part of our brain. And it's the reason why we as a species are capable of consciously or intentionally becoming mindful, becoming aware. A chimpanzee cannot direct its attention to its right shoulder. My dog is lying down on the ground right now. He can't direct his attention to his right paw. I can tap him in his right paw and he can become aware of it. But he lacks that prefrontal cortex, the power of attention. And also recognize that your subconscious mind was fully aware of, for instance, your right shoulder. It was always aware of your right shoulder. Your subconscious mind at the subconscious level is aware of your body. It's aware of the sensation of air on your face, clothing, all sorts of things. But it's at a subconscious level and we're not fully aware of that. But it is occurring all the time. And whenever we engage in an act of mindfulness, we harmonize both the conscious and the subconscious mind. So your subconscious mind was always aware of your right shoulder. And bring your awareness to your right shoulder. And then bring your awareness to your right upper arm, your right elbow and the bend in your right elbow, your right lower arm, your right wrist, the palm of your right hand, your right thumb, index finger, middle finger, fourth finger, baby finger, the top of your right hand, and then moving back up your right wrist, right forearm, right elbow, right upper arm, back to your right shoulder. And then develop the awareness, the sensation of your entire right arm. Sense your right arm is one organic whole. And while remaining aware of your right arm, while keeping part of your awareness on your right arm, divide your attention. And while remaining aware of your right arm, become aware of your right hip, your right upper leg, your right knee and the bend behind your knee, your right shin and calf, your right ankle, your right heel, the bottom of your right foot, including your instep, your right big toe, second toe, middle toe, fourth toe, baby toe, the top of your right foot, and then moving back up your right leg, your right ankle, lower leg, knee, upper leg to your right hip. And while remaining aware of your right arm, develop the awareness of your right leg, becoming aware of both your right arm and your right leg at the same time. And while holding on to the awareness of your right arm and right leg, divide your attention and become aware of your left hip, your left upper leg, your left knee and the bend behind your knee, your left shin and calf, your left ankle, your left heel, the bottom of your left foot, including your instep, your left baby toe, your left fourth toe, your left middle toe, your left second toe, your left big toe, the top of your left foot, your left ankle, your left lower leg, lower leg, and moving back up your left lower leg, your left knee, your left upper leg, to your left hip, 
becoming aware of your whole left foot while remaining aware of your right foot and right arm. And while remaining aware of your right arm, right leg and left leg, divide your attention again and become aware of your left shoulder, your left upper arm, your left elbow and the bend behind your left elbow, your left lower arm, your left wrist, the palm of your left hand, your left baby finger, fourth finger, middle finger, index finger, your left thumb, and then moving back up your left arm, your left wrist, lower arm, elbow, upper arm, to your left shoulder, developing the sensation of your entire left arm. And then become aware, make sure you're aware of all four limbs, right arm, right leg, left leg, and left arm. And there are other exercises where it becomes clear why we do it in this order. The right arm, right leg, left leg, left arm. And try to become aware of all four of your limbs at once. Develop the awareness of all four limbs. And then divide another portion of your attention. And just briefly focus on your spine. And then bring your attention to the very lowest vertebrae in your sacrum. This is below your pelvic bone. Uh, there are five vertebrae in your sacrum, five vertebrae in your lumbar region of your lower back, 12 vertebrae in the thoracic part of your upper middle to upper back, and seven vertebrae in your neck. So let's start at the very bottom with uh, while also remaining of all four, aware of all four limbs, become aware of sacral five, the very bottom of your spine, the tailbone. And then moving up to sacral four, three, two, one. And then moving into your lower back, lumbar five, four, three, two, one and into your middle back, thoracic 12, 11, 10, 9, moving into your upper back, thoracic 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then moving up into your cervical vertebrae in your neck, cervical 7, 6, 5, four, three, two, one, and sensing all four limbs and your entire spine at once, all four limbs and your spine. And then moving up, become aware of the occipital bone, that plate in the very back of your skull, and then become aware of the temporal bones on the sides of your skull, become aware of the parietal bone, on top of your skull, and the frontal bone behind your forehead, and then move your awareness down into your eye sockets. Become aware of your eyes as two spheres almost floating in your eye sockets, and then move your awareness down into your nasal bones, and then down into your facial bones, upper teeth, and then down into your jawbone, lower teeth, and then move your awareness into your tongue and mouth. And becoming aware, making sure you are now aware of all four limbs, your spine, and all of the bones in your head. And then moving into your mouth, down into your throat. Uh, becoming aware of your chest, your whole chest, expanding it to the sides of your chest. Uh, moving your awareness down into your abdomen down into your pelvis, and then finishing with your sexual organs. So aware of all four limbs, your spine, your head, your throat, your chest, your solar plexus, your abdomen, your sexual organs. Becoming aware of the sensation of self, developing this awareness of your organic body, developing the awareness of your organic body as one whole, this sensation of self, which is so important to develop. All mindful exercises that are devoted to sensation should all be building up 
to have this complete picture, this complete awareness of our organic self as one whole, the awareness of the sensation of self, your four limbs, your spine, your head, your throat, your neck, your chest, your solar plexus, midriff, your abdomen, pelvis, sexual organs, being aware of your entire physical body. And try your best to hold on to this awareness. This is a body-brain awareness. This is where we begin. We begin with the sensation of self. And I would like you to expand this awareness slightly and become aware of the sensation of breathing. Become aware of your body and become aware of the sensation of air as it flows in through your nose, nasal cavity, back of mouth, throat, vocal cords, down into your lungs, and then back out again. Becoming aware of the sensation of breathing, the sensation of the flow of air, while also doing your best to remain aware of the sensation of self aware of the flow of air, the sensation of air, and the body, the whole body is one organic whole. And try to hold on to this awareness. This awareness has to go into what Mr. Gurdjieff called the holy denying position. You can look this up, I believe it's uh, pages 1169 to 1173 in the chapter on form and sequence in Beelzebub Tales to his grandson, where he explains the proper form and sequence of developing this personal consciousness, this mindful awareness, that the awareness of our physical self has to be in the holy denying position. Our head brain. Our head brain is responsible for words and pictures and images. Uh, when we consciously look, consciously or mindfully listen, mindfully smell, mindfully taste. These are all occurring in the head brain. But the words and pictures that we can summon in our head brain are also head brain phenomena. So as you remain aware of your body and the sensation of air flowing in and out, represent to yourself that the air contains higher elements, active elements, I like to use the visual image and metaphor of sparkles of light in the air and to imagine that as I breathe in, I'm breathing in sparkles of light, breathing in these higher elements. Madame de Salzman said, represent to them to yourself however you wish. She didn't quite limit it by sparkles of light like I am, but I like to represent it for myself like breathing in sparkles of light. And then Mr. Gurdjieff in his exercise, uh, 1939, the exercise on breathing and digesting higher elements in the air, recommended that as we breathe out, we imagine breathing out a gray, he didn't use the term gray foggy waste. He said, almost imagine like we are breathing out cigarette smoke, which is really a gray foggy waste. Um, back then, a lot more people smoked. It was a, a you know something more of a metaphor that you know they could see around them, breathing in perhaps sparkles of light and breathing out a gray foggy waste, using the head brain and using the imaginative faculty of the head brain. So breathing in sparkles of light and breathing out a gray foggy waste, while in the background sensing our body as one organic whole, sensing our body breathing, sensing that sensation of air flowing in and out, while imagining that we are breathing in sparkles of light and breathing out a gray, foggy waste, using the head brain, using the body brain. Now, as we breathe in, it is possible, and unless you have the higher hydrogens within you, it's a very difficult process, but there are a lot of people who are watching this online and who will look at this video and they will have done a lot of inner work over a lot of years. And 
we can become aware of a different quality that flows from when we breathe in down to our solar plexus. So as we breathe in, become aware of this different quality than sensation flowing from our lungs down to our solar plexus. This is feeling. This is the feeling brain. This is digesting the higher molecules in the air. And then as we breathe out, imagine, become aware, not imagine, but feel this feeling flowing down into our reproductive organs. Now, as I said earlier, uh, Georgia D's exercise takes it to another level and another level and another level, and it's way too complex to share online. This is the limit to a lot of people. The awareness as we breathe in, something flows down to the solar plexus. And here we can even pretend. We can even just focus and pretend that something has happened, that we are aware of something moving from our breath to our solar plexus, and just work on this exercise. And over time, this perception will grow. Now I'm going to take a brief aside and talk a little bit more about feeling. I've done this many times. The easiest place to become aware and to begin to learn to distinguish feeling from sensation is in our extremities. There is a sensation we can feel in our hands when we touch our hands, when we hold things, when we grasp things. Sensation is a body-brain phenomenon, but there's a flow. It's almost like an atmospheric flow that seems, at least for me, and I can only describe it from my own perspective, that flows down around our hands, down around our fingers. It's got an atmospheric quality. It's different than the sensation of my hands. And I know it's the oxygen molecules in the blood, and not just the oxygen molecules, but the higher molecules in my blood. Uh, and it's related to air and breathing. And if we really pay attention to it, we can become aware that there's a gentle pulse to this feeling that's different set than sensation, this gentle flow. And this is feeling, to distinguish feeling from sensation. So if this exercise is too complex for you, try to do a lot of focusing on your hand. And you can also focus on your feet because you can notice it in your extremities the most. This is where we can notice the oxygenation and the higher molecules in our blood flowing down and really isolate this as different than sensation. This is feeling. And this is what we can notice in this exercise. As we breathe in, we can notice this thing, this feeling flowing to our solar plexus. And as we breathe out, we can notice this feeling flowing down to our reproductive organs. So become aware of your body, the sensation of your body, your forelimbs, your spine, uh, your skull, the bones in your face, your head, your mouth, your throat, your chest, your solar plexus, your abdomen, your pelvic region, your uh, sexual organs, reproductive organs, becoming aware of the sensation of self, the sensation of air flowing in. Hold this in the back. And then become aware, imagine breathing in particles of light, breathing out a gray foggy waste, so the head brain and the body brain. And then as you breathe in, become aware of this feeling that flows down to your solar plexus. And as you breathe out, become aware of it flowing down to your reproductive organs. Breathing in and becoming aware of this feeling flowing down and breathing out and becoming aware of it flowing down to your reproductive organs. 
And again, this is a very complex exercise. This is a three-brained exercise. The sensation of our organic self of the body brain, the imagination of our head brain, the breathing in particles of light, breathing out the gray foggy waste, and the feelings of our feeling brain that flow to our solar plexus down to our reproductive organs. So uh, this is, for a lot of people, this is an ideal. This is something you should be striving towards, even doing it just a little bit, just bringing this awareness, this mindful awareness to our breath and to the process of breathing will allow us to begin in a very small way to begin absorbing these higher molecules, these higher particles in the air, which will then be those carbons that need to be present in our system in order for us to do the higher work. Like the saliva already being present in my mouth, the higher meeting with the food, that's the lower, blending into the middle and then going in and meeting with the higher that's already in my stomach in the form of the gastric juices. By doing this exercise and even just consciously breathing, bringing mindful awareness to our breath, we begin this process of assimilating and digesting these higher molecules that we need for more advanced work. So sense your body as one organic whole. Represent breathing in those sparkles of light and breathing out the gray, foggy waste. And ultimately, it's the head brain in the dominant position, the first position, the body brain in the second position, and the feeling brain in the third position. There's a proper form and sequence to this outlined in those pages and tales that I mentioned, and in that whole chapter. So imagine breathing in sparkles of light, breathing out a gray, foggy waste, breathing in sparkles of light while aware of your body and the sensation of your breath, breathing out a gray, foggy waste while remaining aware of your body. And as you breathe in, imagine this feeling or feel this feeling flowing down to your solar plexus. And as you breathe out, imagine it flowing down to your reproductive organs. And then we're gonna add one level of complexity to this again. As you breathe in, think the word I, while you feel it flow into your solar plexus. And as you breathe out, feel this feeling flow down to your reproductive organs. Breathing in the word I, Breathing out the word and, breathing in the word I, and feeling the feeling flow to your solar plexus, breathing out the word am, and feeling it flowing to your reproductive organs. I'm going to be quiet for a minute, and let's just do this. And then just allow your attention to rest. And as I've said, uh, the morning sitting and exercise that I have on the Gurdjieff Group of Toronto uh, YouTube channel, um, which on my wall I posted uh, yesterday, 
along with the announcement for this meeting. It's called the morning sitting. It's a 22 minute exercise and it doesn't have the aside and the explanations. So it, uh, it's much shorter than what I've taken, but I wanted to explain why this is so important. So just allow your attention to rest. Just remain in a calm, tranquil state. And we're going to move into the collected state exercise. As the earth has an atmosphere, so too do we have an atmosphere which surrounds our body. And this atmosphere is composed of elements of the head brain, the feeling brain, and the body brain. So we can disrupt it with our thoughts, with our feelings, and with our sensations. So it's important to keep our thoughts, feelings, and sensations collected, to collect this atmosphere, to keep it around us, perhaps a meter, meter and a half, four to perhaps six feet, uh, to collect it, to become aware of the boundary of the atmosphere, to keep it calm, keep it tranquil. A lot of the inner work we've just done is contained within this atmosphere. It is a proper way to end any inner work, any inner exercises. So imagine that you have this atmosphere around you. Keep it collected, keep it calm, keep it tranquil. And in a moment, I'm going to count from one to three. And when I get to three, breathe it in. One, two, three. Breathe it in. And then as you breathe out, imagine something remains within you. And Mr. Gurdjieff also recommended that after we do inner work, and it's something we should do every morning, we don't just rush off, that we remain and can keep in this collected state. He also said that as we grow uh, uh, in our being, as we you know, do more inner work, we can actually walk down the street in this collected state. Usually when we begin to move and we begin to think, we get identified with thoughts and we lose it. But uh, it's possible to remain in this collected state uh, throughout our day. Or not throughout our day, but points throughout our day. So this is a goal, something we can aim towards. And it's always good to finish in our work, again, with an affirmation. So silently repeat in your mind, repeat after me. May results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me. For my being, any comments on this um whoops sorry i got you muted i've muted everyone um i'll unmute you guys ian um i'm curious in the original uh, the original talk where mr gurdjieff discusses this collective state he says that it will be very tiring when you're starting out <coughs> Um, I I don't find it tiring, and so I wonder what that's about. Am I you're you you are not starting out. <laughs> <laughs> Quite simply, yeah. um, I mean you you've gone on month long Buddhist meditation retreats. Um, you 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 were in a very sensorial Buddhist uh, lineage teaching. Um, you are not a newbie to these teachings. You are not new. Um, and as a matter of fact, in the, in, in the Western world, um, because of mindfulness, we're not starting off at the same place that Mr. Gurdjieff's students were starting off at. Um, in the 1920s, think of the low level of being of people in England, America, France, even in the 1940s. So, you know, that, uh, you know, exposition that I posted just, I think it was yesterday. Um, was for a new student. And, you know, the more we do it, the more we do this work, 
the more we do this exercise, the more we have those higher molecules, the more we grow our higher being, our Kesjian body, our higher being body, and the more we are capable of doing these things without experiencing that exhaustion. But for people who are brand new to this work, um, especially if they've lived their whole life in their head brain and they've never really brought their attention to their body brain or their feeling brain, um, it, it does require a lot of energy. Um, any other comments? Okay. Um, so, C12. The highest energy that the human body is capable of producing. Food comes in as dough 768, and through the transformation process, it comes in in our mouth at that. Through the transformation process, it moves into Ray 3, I think it's 394, in our stomach, then me 192 in our duodenum. And air has to come in. The octave of air then begins. It begins at Do 192. And it gives the Mi 192 the, the sufficient intensity to then move to Fa 96 in our liver, the liver of the seat of anger. You know, if we think about feeding the moon and we connect this transformational process, as I've talked about uh, when I was, you know, the, the, the bits that I did in esoteric psychology learning these correspondence, um, that transformation of the octave of food uh, into Fa 96 in our liver. And the liver is tradi traditionally and historically the seat of anger. And there's a certain kind of anger that is world 96 anger. It's a real dense, heavy, the lose it, homicidal emotion and road rage kind of it, anger. And when we experience that, we lose complete awareness of ourselves. We're feeding the moon. It's what happens in wars, you know, what happens in fights, what happens with road rage. Um, so fa 96 in the liver, and then it goes up to do me fa so 48 in the cerebral hemispheres. And you know, uh, do 48 of the octave of impressions. Um, so the thoughts in our head are actually fairly slow. Um, they're hydrogen 48. They're slower than our feelings, slower than our subconscious mind. This is why our thoughts lag behind our feelings and our feelings can overpower our thoughts because we get just trapped in them. Um, and then it moves to the cerebellum, which is law 24. Um, and then, or not, yeah, law 24, do me so law, and then down to the testes, which is C12. So in terms of, you know, we have three being foods, the octave of food, the octave of air, and the octave of impressions. But within a normal human being, the highest substance that they produce is C12. And if you want to lawfully use C12, you bring it into contact with so 48 of the octave of air, and it transforms in the middle again into the sensation of self. So to be aware and mindful of our hands, the sensation of hands, not the feeling we can feel in the hands, but to be aware of the sensation of hands requires law 24. That's the energy that fuels all sensory awareness of our body. And it's interesting how Mr. Gurdjieff said it's transformed in the cerebellum, which is right back in the lower part of the brain. And neuroscientists said that the cerebellum is responsible for the awareness of the body, the awareness of the body in space. Um, so they are saying that the cerebellum does feed that physical awareness. Um, but C12. It gets transformed in the testes, in the ovaries, in our reproductive organs. And it's a 12, it's a hydrogen 12. And 
we don't have the proper flow, the proper transformation of energies along the octave of air, which is connected to emotions and feelings, or along the octave of impressions, which is connected to looking, listening, smelling, tasting, the external perceptions, as well as the thoughts and images in our mind. And those, the, the, the human body, the normal human being does not naturally produce the substances necessary for the further evolution and the development of our inner bodies and our higher bodies. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said, nature gave us the first mechanical shock, which is breathing and air coming in at Do 192, meeting the Mi 192 in the duodenum and allowing the octave of food to develop to Fa 96 in the liver. But the next shock has to and can only be a conscious shock. And he called it the first conscious shock, which is self-remembering. Um, I don't want to go too much into that right now because the explanation, I want to talk about C12. Because we do not have those higher elements within us, those higher carbons, like the saliva as the higher carbon in our mouth to meet the food, and the gastric juices as the higher carbon in our stomach to meet with what then goes down into our stomach. Because we do not have those higher carbons within us to help the octave of impressions and to help the uh, octave of air, those centers, those parts are capable of stealing C12 and using C12 to help uh, transform a higher substance. But this higher substance is actually, it's more like a malignant substance. And uh, my apologies, I'm going to, uh, I don't know if this is appearing. I think this will be appearing on uh, the Facebook group uh, uh, online, um, but it's not appearing on our, our wall right now, but I'm going to uh, um, bring up a, Oh, I don't know if I have it there. Um, uh, just give me a second. I have it somewhere. Yeah, here it is. I will bring up a picture. Okay, sorry about this. Just one more second. Share the screen. This is, I did this years ago. This is a representation of the misuse of C12. So I represented C12 in blue and the possible ways that it is abnormally used. Now, last week, we talked about the car and how when people get into a car, that the car itself becomes an extension of the self. Um, the same, you can notice this about clothing, about jewelry, this is physical identification. The proper use and the proper thing for the body is the sensation of self. And for some reason, this sensation of self can be expanded into the clothing that we wear. So we can strut about like roosters or paint the face or extend it into cars and we extend this identification in an abnormal way. And when we do this, everything that we do, everything that we perceive, leaves a crystallization, it leaves an impression behind inside ourselves. So we create these abnormal crystallizations with inside ourselves, utilizing an energy that should go to build our Hesgen body, our higher 
body at the level of world 24. So a lot of uh, what we have to do is not only properly do exercises and develop the proper form and sequence of doing exercises, we've got to stop feeding these crystallizations and there are processes that we can do where we can begin to decrystallize them by not giving them any more power. Um, most people have these abnormal growths at this higher level of world 24 within them, and they're supposed to have proper growths, proper crystallizations at this level. So physically, you know, an example is a car where a person's awareness extends to their car, that sensory awareness. And one of the things we can notice along all of these, all of these red things underneath it is the ego, the subjectivizing principle, the me, my, and mine. So when our sensation expands to the car and the dimensions of the car, Underneath that awareness, there's a subtle, very subtle taste of the ego. And this is why people can get into road rage and all of these things can happen because their ego is underlying this extension of their awareness into their car, into their clothing, into their shoes, into their jewelry, into their makeup, into their hair. Um, so it's a form of physical identification, and beneath that is the taste of the ego. We can move into emotional identification, and a lot of people think, you know, this is negative emotions, and in part, it is negative emotions. But this is a mistake and a problem on the part of Uspensky who said negative emotions are absolutely useless. Mr. Gurdjieff obviously was aware of what he was teaching. He probably even read In Search of the Miraculous. Maybe I wouldn't surprise me if Madame Uspensky, who always remained loyal to him, provided him with a copy. And he certainly knew from other people what Uspensky was teaching. And he went out of his way to emphasize that not all negative emotions are useless just probably 99.9%. .9%. But he talked about that fear, for instance, could have a precognitive function, that you know it could be warning us about something, and that all of our negative emotions, that there could be a positive dimension to them, such as fear, you know, I don't want to go down that street, I'm very frightened and I'm going to take this route. And, you know, when we have those feelings, we should listen to them. Those negative emotions are absolutely essential for our safety and well-being. And we've got to learn to notice, is this because of my ego? Is the reason I don't want to go down that road because that was where that girl broke up with me and she laughed in my face and going by that tree brings all those memories? Or is it something else? Um, so by learning to look beneath and to see the machinations of the ego or the, or, or the crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ kunda buffer, another definition of that, um, where we see things topsy-turvy. In other words, we develop a completely subjective rather than objective view of reality. Um, so is the ego involved or should I avoid going down that street? Now, it's not just negative emotions. You get angry. How can they do that to me? Or I'm so depressed. I just can't believe the world. A lot of suicidal thoughts. And people who commit suicide are in this incredibly subjective state of poor me, I can't believe this. And, uh, and I've experienced that state myself. And afterwards, I went, wow, that is pure ego, that wallowing in our misery. But 
We can also walk down the street like we are masters of the universe. Some positive emotions can be very egocentric, and they are also the misuse of this energy. So the taste of the ego, the me, my, mind, the subjectivizing principle, what's in it for me? And we've got to realize that the ego, a lot of what is, or a lot of what are manifestations of the ego are not seen as manifestations of the ego until you learn to taste the ego behind things. I'll explain this in a minute. Then we have our head brain. And within our head brain, this is where we begin to imagine. And we imagine, you know, perhaps we're getting that new job or we're wearing that new suit or we're talking to that beautiful girl or whatever. Um, the head brain, the words and pictures, uh, you know, people, you know, academics write books for acclaim, scientists explore science and do their research, hoping to win a Nobel Prize. Um, you know, this head brain ego goes all the way back to getting gold stars in kindergarten and, you know, getting on the honors roll. And I'm so proud, son, you're on the honors roll. And, um, you know, there's the, the, the head brain uh, misuse of this energy. And I call it, uh, as I said, J.G. Bennett called it sensitive energy. I prefer to call it the energy of identity. And C12 is an energy. I don't have a mist sprayer now. But it's like we can spray this mist onto my nation, onto my tribe. We can spray it onto the extension of my car. We can spray it onto all different forms of identification so identification the word comes from identity so we can spray it on all these illusionary things or we can turn it around and spray it on ourselves, on the awareness of our body on this sensation this mindful awareness and not just ourselves because mr gurdjieff described world 40 or uh, world 24 the planetary realm hydrogen 24 with the word personal consciousness so when we become personally conscious on the emotional level we become aware of what we are feeling when we become personally conscious uh, within the octave of impressions we become aware of the fact we are seeing hearing, smelling, tasting, or we become aware that we are thinking or visualizing images. So personal consciousness, this self-identity, this self-reflectivity. So this realm, when the uh, C12 is hijacked, underneath it is the taste of the ego and it's always there you just have to dig down deeper and deeper now the hindus or more particularly sri aurobindo sri aurobindo not sri aurobindo who i actually spent three years studying at university in the early 80s he's a fourth way hindu i don't want to explain that now but it's absolutely amazing the similarities that he has with Mr. Kurji in terms of the harmonious development. Perhaps I will do a meeting on that, uh, connecting the teachings. Um, but he said that the ego can be sattvic, it can be tamasic, or it can be rajasic. And these are the three gunas. Sattva is intelligence, goodness. Uh, tamas is inertia. Um, and rajas is like passion and emotion. And so we think, you know, that passion and I want this and I want that. We think of that as the ego. We also think of the tamasic, the inertia, you can't do that to me as the ego when we're not really aware of the sattvic ego. The sattvic ego, um, most people who, you know, work for charities, 
who go, you know, they want to go to Africa to help the poor and the starving, um, who give money. They do it from a position of the sattvic ego. They think they're doing good, but they're not aware that the taste of the ego lies behind this. And this is why uh, Jesus is quoted as saying, you know, give in private. Don't let anyone know about your giving. Because, you know, having hospitals named after you or wings or whatever, it's the ego. It may seem charitable. It may seem like you're doing this work and helping people. But if you're doing it from the ego, it's wrong. That work needs to be selfless. It needs to be egoless. So there are these three dimensions to the ego, you know, the, the do-gooder, the helper. Um, but, you know, secretly they're patting themselves on the back. Secretly the ego is underlying and hidden beneath their actions that seem very altruistic, and they're not really altruistic. They just appear altruistic and people pat them on the back and you're such a wonderful person and they smile and their ego is gratified by this. So we've got to realize that the ego is not just this passionate, grasping, selfish. It is that, but it has these three dimensions. And Sattva is the holy affirming, Tamas is the holy denying, Rajas is the holy reconciling, you know, the more cerebral, the more physical, the more emotional. Um, Hinduism is really, you know, they understand the three brains without fully understanding them. It's very much a triunal system. And uh, so it gives us a little bit better understanding. Um, I'll just stop this sharing. So these are the different ways we can misuse C12 through this process of identification. Um, any comments, any questions? We, we're, we've got another nine minutes. Um, anything you want to ask? I'm, I guess I'm curious about the proper use of C12. The sensation of self. Okay. Um, the one thing you can be guaranteed when you are sensing your body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, when you are sensing yourself from side to side, inside out, outside in, you are not misusing C12 in that moment. You can sense your body and then misuse it and sense your body and misuse it. You sort of flip out of that awareness. But in this process of being aware of our body as one organic whole, being aware of what Mr. Gurdjieff termed the sensation of self. And if you read Meetings with Remarkable Men, he talks about getting into that sort of duel with the other boy who ended up becoming a really good friend of his and uh, a fellow seeker, how they were interested in the same girl and they decided to go into the artillery range overnight. And in that artillery range, when his life was threatened, he developed that organic awareness of his self. I had a gun pointed at my head when I was 18. I had that same experience of my physical embodiment, my sensation of self. So sometimes having a gun pointed at you or being in a, a position like hiding in an artillery range can give you this awareness. And once you have this awareness, then it becomes easier to have it again. Uh, sometimes the first one is hardest. So. In that experience, in uh, meetings with remarkable men, is the first time Mr. Gurdjieff uses the phrase, the sensation of self. And when we are doing this, when we are aware of ourself, from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, and it, Mr. Gurdjieff said we should build the sensation of, that's why I always start, you know, describing it from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, but it should be like this. Get to the point where we can instantaneously become aware of the sensation of ourself. And in this moment, we are lawfully using this energy and we are not engaging in the misuse of C12. Um, 
Any other questions? Oops, Karen, your microphone's muted. I see your, uh, I, your uh, I can't unmute your microphone. Okay. Uh, what were the uh, page numbers you uh, mentioned about in? Uh, this is from memory, but it's the chapter on form and sequence. And I think it's 1169 to 1173. He actually talks about the, um, oh, I forget the phrase that he uses, but it seems to be the difference between knowledge and understanding. But he's actually talking about the receiving of impressions. Um, that in one way, the impressions don't come in right and it's all messed up. And in the other play, way, they come in right. And he talks about the holy denying and what, he's, what he means there is the sensation of self. So whatever we do, if we can do it with that sensation of self, getting back to Ian's question and connecting them, if we are talking to someone and we are aware of the sensation of self and we're holding that in the background, we are receiving impressions through our head brain properly. Um, if we don't, you know, they, they talk about, you know, some people talk so they can say things. They're not really listening. They're waiting for an opportunity to put their two cents in. They're not mindfully aware of what the other person is saying. Um, and Mr. Gurdjieff says, as people get older, they are unable to receive new impressions. Not everyone. I've you know, met old people and you talk to them and everything you say, oh yes, that takes me, you know, that reminds me of 1931 and I was doing this. And there's nothing new. Everything presses a button inside themselves. If they had spent time learning to sense their body, those buttons wouldn't be pressed and they would be receiving and hearing things for the first time, uh, receiving a new impression. And this is one of the major themes of Beelzebub Tales, which is why I don't really want to discuss too much of it, because you only have one chance to receive the first impression. And so if you learn all about tales and you read books on it, what it's about, and then you read it, you will not be reading it as a first impression. Um, but you've read it. So pages 1169 to right the end of that chapter. And I think it's 1173 is the end of the chapter of Beelzebub Tales. Antoine. When you say C12, you mean uh, the note C on a hydrogen fan? Yes, the note C12. Do, re, mi, fa, la, la, so. Do re mi fa so la si. So C12 as in S I 12. Not C12, but C12. Um, yes. And hi Whoops, I'm not picking you up. So, uh, and uh, 12 is uh, related to hydrogen 12. Yes. Um, you know, let me just go back uh, to the diagram. Um, so if you notice along here, where did I get, uh, uh, a draw 12. So all along here, um, on my Facebook page, whoops. So, um, here, 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 those are all 12 phenomenon, hydrogen 12 phenomenon, and we are talking about C12, I'm just circling it, of the octave of food. This is the, the area that's problematic, I'll stop sharing. So yes, um, C12 of the oxygen, uh, octave of food. You go to my webpage, or my, my, my webpage, my wall, and right at the top of my wall I have um, the, alchemy, the, the alchemy of human transformation, and I've got waking sleep, personal consciousness, and objective consciousness, and the different molecules that they involve. And, you know, for, for the middle one, for personal consciousness, it's the breathing exercises and doing the inner work as well. Even just sensing our body, 
will allow us to begin producing some of these higher energies and sensing the body like JG 60 point exercise or Mr. Gurdjieff's filling exercise teach us us how to enter into a state where we can sense the body and in that sensation of self the awareness of the body as one organic whole we are not misusing that energy so at that point you know we are in a lawful process yes antoine okay so when when we are in c12 it means it's the higher emotional center no no c12 is physical um okay it's the physical body it's the sexual center uh is fueled okay. by c12 um the higher emotional is i mean he talked about uh the higher emotional is being fueled by hydrogen 24 and um so that would be ray 24 of the octave of air but there are also even higher aspects and higher dimensions of the emotional center. Uh, you have to understand to Uspensky with In Search of the Miraculous, he didn't expound everything. Um, they were starting out at a very low level and rather than talk about the high level, which people will then begin to imagine and hallucinate and pretend that they are there, he kept it very practical, very down to the lower level, but he defined the higher emotional center as being hydrogen 48. But we can also have experiences of hydrogen 12 uh, at the emotional level, that's so 12, um, but the hydrogen emotional, uh, higher emotional is, um, do me, mean, fa 12, or fa 24. He defined the higher intellectual center as hydrogen six, and I believe that's fa six of the octave of impressions. So emotions are the octave of air, the body and physical sensations and the sexual center are the octave of food, and then the octave of impressions are the head brain. Um, so the body brain, feeling brain, and head brain in terms of those different octaves. So the, the body brain is the octave of food, the feeling brain is the octave of air, and the head brain is the octave of impressions. Um, at any rate, we're out of time. Um, thank you all for joining me uh, on this uh, day on uh, um, February. Thank you very much, Alan. Take care. I've given you a lot, and you know, a lot to digest. Um, but you'll notice I, you know, I go back over and. Uh, um, okay, I'm gonna say goodbye now. Take care. Thank you.